Good morning. Welcome to Bethany Lutheran in Warren, Oregon. Today I'm preaching on our gospel text according to the lectionary, which is Matthew chapter 10, verses 5a and 21 through 33. These 12, that is the disciples, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next, for truly I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the, the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Belzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today, I also want to read for you Psalm 91 because my sermon is actually going to be more off of this psalm than off of the gospel text for today. And Psalm 91 is, You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, who say, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in darkness or the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Because you've made the Lord your refuge, the most high your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, and the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. About 20 years ago, a movie called The Perfect Storm was released. It graphically portrayed the dangers of the fishing industry through the tale of the Andrea Gale, 
a fishing boat out of Gloucester, Massachusetts. Their families, as well as the whole town, were hurting financially, so they decided to risk everything and travel to a remote but fertile fishing ground during the unpredictably stormy month of October. On their way back to Gloucester, the Andrea Gale was caught in the perfect storm of 1991, which actually was three storms coming together. The crew was never heard from again. Sebastian Junger, author of The Perfect Storm, says, there are many kinds of work that are dangerous. But one of the interesting things about fishing is that it really hasn't changed much over time. It's become me mechanized, of course, but the basic reality of going to sea for months at a stretch is the same as it was 100 years ago. You are way beyond help from anyone else. You are on your own. And I think that forms a certain kind of character. Not only does everyone know someone who has died at sea, but everyone who works in the fishing industry has almost died. Every single fisherman you talk to has almost gotten nailed at one time or another. Last week, we looked at the first part of Matthew 10, where Jesus called and sent his first disciples. He gave them their marching orders. In Mark, Chapter 1, verse 17, Jesus tells them, I will make you fishers of men. Then he tells them that they will be like sheep among wolves. Jesus adds that they will be flogged and arrested. But don't worry, I'll tell you what to say. <laughs> Gee, thanks, Jesus. In this week's text, Jesus tells his mission team, all men will hate you because of me. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. He adds, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. They cannot kill your soul. Oh, well, that's different. No worries, Jesus. Sign me up. Well, it takes courage to be a fisherman. It takes courage to fish for the souls of men as well. It is not the job for a fair weather Christian. And so the lectionary pairs up Matthew 10 with Psalm 91, a promise of divine protection. And that psalm is the main focus of my message today. In the first two verses of Psalm 91, the author uses four of the most common and powerful names for God. Elvon, Most High, Shaddai, Almighty, Yahweh, Lord, and Elohim, my God. Each of these names offers encouragement in dangerous times. Because God is high and lifted up, he's not caught up in the cause and effect of the world. Because he's our faithful covenant Lord, he will not forsake us in conflict. Because he is my God, he will not lose me in the confusion and struggle of humanity. I find this psalm to be one of the easier ones to relate to today's world. Listen to a 2023 translation of the first half according to the disciple Ingrid. You may want to follow along with the psalm. He who regularly spends time in God's church will rest in his sanctuary. His shadow will be my sunscreen and protect me from the damaged ozone layer. I tell you that God is my safe room, my bomb shelter, my storm cellar, and my self-isolation site. I can trust him. He will save me from the terrorist trap, hidden landmine, land mines, and IEDs. And he will protect me during smallpox, bubonic plague, and swine flu epidemics. He will surround me with airbags of protection and shelter me like a mother who secures her baby in its safety approved rear facing car seat in the back seat of her car and puts a baby on board emblem in her car's rear window. 
His faithfulness will be my riot shield and bulletproof vest. I will not fear the break-ins and murders of the night, nor the stray bullet of a drive-by shooting by day, nor AIDS or STDs that stalk through date rates in the darkness, nor the meningitis in MRSA that destroy at midday. A thousand may fall around me from COVID and even tens of thousands, but it will not take me. News channels and the internet show me so much disease and suffering around the world, but it will not come near me. At least that is what the psalmist seems to say. Verse 8, you only have to look around and you will see the wicked getting their due reward. They will be punished. Verse 9, if the Lord has your back, you will live on easy street. No evil can touch you. Yes, times are bad, but for that very reason, your confidence in God needs to be stronger than ever. Really? <laughs> That's fantastic. Sign me up now. I can be a believer in that kind of a God. I just sign on the dotted line and I will not get AIDS or be a COVID long hauler. I will not have to attend my child's funeral. I won't have to endure chemo treatments or claim my son's flag draped coffin when he's shipped home from the battlefield. Even with all the descriptions of divine protection, Psalm 91 does not deny that harm may befall us. If the psalm tells us how God will rescue us from our trials and afflictions, it goes without saying there must be trials and afflictions from which rescue is required. The threats around us make people nervous, afraid, even cynical. The psalmist wants to tell us that God is bigger. Instead of letting the powers at work in the world determine how we feel, we need to view the world through the confidence we place in God. God, not Fox News, should shape our viewpoints, bring us a confidence that surpasses cynicism, and apprise our hopes. In closing, the psalmist offers us a strong case of yebits. Now, if you've had a teenager in your home, you know about the yebits. Mom says, you can go to the game Thursday night. Just remember your curfew on a school night is 10 o'clock. The reply, yeah, but it's an away game. The cheer bus won't be back on campus until 1030. Dad says, no, you can't go to a party this weekend. You know you're grounded. The reply, yeah, but the party is for the youth group at church. Mom says, did you hit your sister again? The reply, yeah, but she was bugging me. The argument of Psalm 91 is times are bad even for believers. Yeah, but for the very reason. Your confidence in God needs to be stronger than ever. Instead of letting the nervous, uncertain, and cynical world around us determine how we feel, we need to let our confidence in God become the lens through which we view the world. The language of Psalm 91 is magnanimously confident. There's no hesitation here. Verses 14 through 16 show God's reaction for his people when we are calling out in need of rescue. Yeah, but I will rescue you. Yeah, but I will protect you. Yeah, but I will answer you. Yeah, but I will be with you in trouble. Yeah, but I will deliver you. Yeah, but I will honor you. Yeah, but I will satisfy you with long life. Yeah, but I will show you my salvation. The promise of the psalm is not that we will never suffer, but that trouble and trials will not conquer us and will not be the end of us. 
as Romans 8.39 says, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So if we get back to our gospel text, we disciples are warned of betrayal and persecution as we go about our evangelism project. Our psalm tells us that, yes, we will face trials in the world. Yeah, but God will protect us. But I ask you today, what do you have to fear if you share the good news of Christ in your community? If you invite non-churchgoers to come to church, do you expect to be persecuted or your families harmed or bullied? Most of you do not even have jobs. You're retired, so you don't need to be concerned about being fired. Do you fear civil law or police harassment if you speak of Christ outside of the church building? I venture forth that the biggest fear you may have about fishing for men, about sharing the message of salvation, is not knowing what to say. So we are working on this for the next few weeks. Now, last week, I asked you to make a list of 12 people who you know for sure do not go to church. Then you were to pray every day for each of these 12 people. Now, most people do not want to hear you quote scripture that they may not understand anyway. They want to hear why Christ makes a difference in your life. Why is this faith thing so important to you? What is your faith story? If you're going to go fishing for people, you need to have the right bait. So your assignment for this week is to work up an answer to why Christ makes a difference in your life. What is your faith story? Why is your faith important to you? Write out your witness message. It should take no more than two minutes. You don't want it long. Practice saying it out loud. Then stand in front of a mirror and ask yourself out loud, why do you believe in God? And give your answer to that person in the mirror. Then bring your written witness to church next Sunday for step three. Also, keep praying for the 12 people on your list from last week. Pray for them to feel a need for God in their life. Jesus told us to go fishing for people. So let's rid ourselves of the yebbets and go fishing. Amen.